This is an audio rendition of Chapter 9 of Dave Roberson's book, The Walk of the Spirit, The Walk of Power, The Vital Role of Praying in Tongues, as read by me, Keith Davis. Each chapter starts with a prophetic message at the beginning. I begin by reading this message. You have desired to know me. You have desired the intimacy of the Spirit that can only come through edification and worship. Hear what the Spirit would say. For I desire to fellowship with you. I desire to operate through you in my power so that others might be blessed. Come aside and come up higher. Begin to fellowship with me and I will begin to fellowship with you. And even though the path grows narrower, I will take you into a holy communion with myself. For it is through my fellowship with you that your hunger and thirst is quenched. Chapter 9 The Edification Process Are you beginning to grasp just how wide and deep and high this subject of tongues really is? Well, there is much more territory to explore. Let me take you further now into the edification process that occurs as you allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you. What does it mean to edify your spirit? 1 Corinthians 14.4 tells us what happens when we pray in tongues for any amount of time. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. The word edification is derived from the word edifice, which means a massive, magnificent building. So when you pray in tongues, you are actually erecting a superstructure, a divine operation on the inside of your spirit to house the anointing of God and to qualify you for your divine calling. Most of the time when ministers preach on the subject of tongues, they emphasize the fact that when you pray in tongues, you charge up your spirit the way you would charge up a battery in the natural. They tell you that your spirit is actually receiving a spiritual charge, a tangible force or anointing, something like electricity. Then, later when you lay hands on someone, that tangible force goes pow, and the power of God goes into that person to heal, deliver, and set free. Well, that's true as far as it goes. However, before that tangible anointing is manifested through a person, he must go through the edification process that causes it to manifest. Not many Christians seem to know anything about that process. Often they think that they receive some kind of magical charge from praying in tongues that will immediately begin to operate through them. I used to believe like that. I thought God would anoint me just as I was. Little did I know that he wasn't at all intending to leave me in my carnal state. That isn't what edification is all about. I remember what a surprise it was to me when the Lord started, started to use me after I had spent several months praying in my prayer closet. The second meeting I ever held, the Holy Spirit prompted me to call a woman out of the audience. I was scared. This was all new to me. I told the woman, Ma'am, you have something wrong with your body and God wants to heal you. Then I laid my hands on both sides of her face, closed my eyes, and began to pray my hardest prayer. But in the middle of my prayer, this lady left. Talk about humiliating. I was too embarrassed to open my eyes. Here I was, standing in front of a crowd of people, and the woman I was praying for had just left. When I had exhausted everything I could think of to pray and finally got brave enough to open my eyes, I looked around to see where the woman had gone, and there she was lying on the floor. I thought, oh Lord, look at that. That must be what it means to receive a charge from praying in the Holy Ghost. I didn't know what to do, but when the woman got back on her feet, she was healed. For a long time, that was all I thought about being edified in the Holy Ghost meant. God was charging up my spirit pouring a powerful anointing into me to use when ministering to others. But as I kept praying in tongues, I began to realize that there was much, much more to this edification process 
than anyone had ever told me. The devil can't understand the mysteries. Some people wonder what effect we are having on the devil and his plans when we pray in tongues for edification. One thing we are not doing is ordering the devil around. He doesn't even understand what we are, say what we are saying. The word says that when a man prays in an unknown tongue, he isn't talking to men. He is speaking with God. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. If I don't understand what I'm praying, why would it be the devil's business to know? Why would God allow him to have the upper hand on me? If the devil understands the mysteries and I don't, then he has an edge on me. That's why I can't accept the idea that the devil can understand us when we pray in tongues. When we begin to pray in tongues for personal edification, we enter into a holy closet and are born again, recreated, seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus' spirit, is locked in a divine communication with God himself. It is a personal communication, a holy communion, and the devil cannot enter there. If I were to call the President of the United States and he personally answered the telephone, you would find me passed out on the floor from shock. The President is much too busy of a man to talk to me. On the other hand, my Heavenly Father is continually administrating over the life of every believer, both in heaven and on earth. Yet, when I speak with tongues, I immediately enter in divine communication with God himself. He picks up the, quote, red telephone on the other end and says, I know that's you, Roberson, and I know what you want. And because the Holy Ghost in his wisdom is praying this prayer in your stead, I want you to know that the answer is on its way, and there is nothing the devil can do about it. That's why the devil hates praying in tongues because he has absolutely no idea what we're saying to God, and it makes him nervous. Why doesn't he understand? Well, look back at the temple built under the Old Covenant. Within the temple was the outer court, where the people sacrificed to God, the inner court, where the priests offered sacrifices to God on behalf of the people, and finally, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence dwelt. Only the high priest was allowed in the Holy of Holies once a year to present the blood sacrifice for the Israelite people. If the devil had ever had the audacity to try to break through that veil and penetrate the Holy of Holies, he never would have made it. It was completely out of his jurisdiction. He had no access there. The temple is a shadow or type of the believer. As a believer... My body is the temple of God because the Holy Spirit has come and made his abode on the inside of me. My flesh is the outer court, my soul the inner court. But my born-again, recreated spirit is a type of the Holy of Holies, and nobody but nobody except my high priest is allowed inside there. So when I pray in tongues, Satan has no idea what God is saying to me. Why? Because the Holy Spirit creates that supernatural language within my Holy of Holies, and it is outside of all satanic jurisdiction. I know a man whose sister was in a car accident. She was transported to the hospital, her life hanging by a thread. This man was a faith man. As he headed for the hospital as fast as he could drive, he confessed over and over, my sister will live and not die. She will live and not die. But every time this man would make this confession, she'll live and not die, something would shatter his emotions so badly that it just shook him up from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Then the thought would hit him, she'll die. This happened again and again as the man sped toward the hospital. It was really shaking him up. Then suddenly, through the gift of the discerning of spirits, God opened this man's spiritual eyes. The discerning of spirits allows you to see into the realm of the spirit, whether angels or demons. When God opened this man's eyes, he saw two demons, one sitting on his left shoulder, the other on his right. Every time the man would make his confession, she'll live and not die, one demon would scream through his ear to the other demon, she'll die, she'll die. Then the Lord spoke to the man in his spirit, Make your confession, and then begin to pray in tongues. So the man made his confession one more time, and began to pray in tongues. After a while, 
one of the demons looked around the back of the man's head at the other demon and said, What do you think he's saying? The other devil said, I don't know, but is it burning you the way it's burning me? Yes, the other demon answered. Do you think we should leave? So they left. And you may as well know, the man's sister lived and did not die. Building yourself up on your most holy faith. So what happens when I pray in tongues for personal edification, which I can do at will any time I desire? Why is this the most foolish of all gifts to the natural mind, so important and so powerful? Let's look at Jude 20 and 21 to discover more of our answer. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We know that God is only pleased by and only moves in response to our faith. In Romans 10:17, Paul tells us, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But we also know that we can hear, and hear, and hear the word, and yet not see any change in our lives. We still have to get that word planted in our spirits, and then find some way to release the faith that the word has produced. Thousands of people around the world are filled to overflowing with God's word. Yet still, for the most part, the church does not experience the miraculous results found in the book of Acts. So there must be a missing ingredient most believers are unaware of. The truth is, any minister, no matter how anointed and full of the word he may be, can only tell you what he has learned through experience and as the Holy Ghost has taught him in his own times of meditation on the Word. But that teaching will not profit you if you don't find some way to mix faith with it. You must personally get that Word into your spirit, and then let the Holy Spirit teach you. That's why Jude says we are to build ourselves up on our most holy faith by praying always in the Holy Ghost. It is only as we willingly and freely present our bodies as a living sacrifice and take the time to endure in prayer that the Holy Ghost can begin to reveal to us the mysteries of Christ. Only then can He release the faith in our hearts that is needed for God's power to operate in our lives. Hungry for God's Power Ever since I was born again, I have been so hungry to know God in His power. At first, I thought there was something wrong with me because I encountered so many groups of believers who just didn't seem to be hungry. They just didn't seem to care that they lived such powerless lives. I would wonder, Lord, why aren't more people hungry for your power like I am? Is it the call you have on my life to operate in miracles that makes me different? I was so hungry for God's power when I was first born again that I would try anything that I was told would help me walk in more power. If it promised to satisfy the hunger on the inside of me, I would do it. One person said to me, no wonder you're not walking in the power of God. I asked, why not? Because of the jewelry you're wearing. You mean if I take this jewelry off, I will walk in God's power? That's right. So I took off my jewelry. What happened? Well, before I took off my jewelry, I was a powerless jewelry wearer. And after I took it off, I became a powerless non-jewelry wearer. It didn't make a bit of difference. Then later, when I moved to Oregon and hooked up with another group of believers, someone told me, no wonder you don't walk in the power of God. Why not? Well, how were you baptized? I was baptized in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, no wonder, the person explained. You were baptized in the name of three gods, and there is only one God. This particular group believed there is only one God whose name is Jesus. Well, then... I said, I'll just get rebaptized. As I said, at that point in my Christian walk, if I thought something meant more power in my life, I was all for it. Get rebaptized, just name the place. We were in the middle of an Oregon winter at an elevation of 4,800 feet. It was snowing, the ground was frozen, and the two ponds were covered with a thick layer of ice. After building a bonfire beside the upper pond, a group of us were baptized in the freezing water that flowed through the flume, which is an artificial channel built to transport logs by water, between the two ponds. The preacher and I were first to step down into the frigid water. I was too ignorant to know that I could have been baptized in a warm bathtub. 
It was so cold my legs started to turn blue. I felt like I was freezing to death. But I was determined to go under the water and get rebaptized so I could have more power in my life. The preacher asked me, Are you ready? With chattering teeth, I stammered, Okay, baptize me. So he dunked me in the icy water, baptizing me in the name of Jesus. Well, in the months that followed, I came to realize that before I was immersed in that freezing water, I was a powerless Pentecostal boy, supposedly baptized in the name of three gods. Then that preacher shoved me under the icy water and baptized me in the name of Jesus, and I became a powerless Pentecostal boy baptized in the name of one God. Once again, it didn't make one bit of difference. It was until later, the day I discovered I had uncovered a spiritual law, that I learned a vital key to releasing God's power in my life. Oh, Brother Roberson, can you teach me to walk in power? Oh, yes, I can. And I don't care if your name is Susie Wallpaper or Joe Public either. This key isn't reserved for an elect few. Just keep on reading this book, and I'll teach you how to walk out of everything that Jesus said you've been delivered from. I'll, teach, I'll also teach you how to walk into everything he said you could be in your life on purpose just because you want to go there. The answer is just available to you who want it as the air you breathe, contending for the faith. When the Holy Ghost began to reveal to me the treasures hidden in the book of Jude, I realized I had discovered an important key in my search to know God and His power. First, I latched on to verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and ex exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I was so excited when I read that. We should earnestly contend for the devil-stomping, mountain-moving kind of faith that was once delivered to the saints. Why was I so excited? Well, one thing I had learned about God's word was this. God wouldn't tell me to contend for the faith without then going on in minute detail to teach me how to contend. I was on the right track, tracking down my answer. You see, it wasn't enough to know I should contend for the faith. The cry of my heart was, for God's sake, can someone teach me how? Don't wave a delicious steak in front of my face and then not give it to me. Once I was discussing this passage of scripture with another minister and he asked me, what is your background on the subject of faith? I answered, The Word of God is my only background on the subject of faith. I am a faith man. I take God's Word for what it says. I'm not moved by what I see, hear, or feel. I'm not moved by disease or financial lack. Only one standard controls my life, and that's what the Word of God says about my problem. Not the devil, not the circumstances, only the Word of God. Well, then... The man said, if you believe all that, you already have more faith than the early church had. I beg your pardon, I replied. If I'm going to have more faith than the early church had, it seems to me I'm first going to have at least as much. If I remember correctly, during one of Peter's revivals, people lay the sick and dying in the streets near the meeting because those on whom Peter's shadow fell were getting healed. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I continued. But I didn't notice anyone laying the sick on the street near this meeting in the hope that our shadow would fall on them and heal them. It seems to me that we need to contend for that kind of powerful faith that was once delivered to those early saints. Then in verse 4, Jude tells us what happened to the mountain-moving faith in which the early church operated. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Certain men had crept into the church unawares. Whoever these men were, to a large extent, they stole the faith of the early church. So I conducted a study on these men from the book of Jude, if for no other reason than to find out what path I should not take. I didn't want my faith to suffer the same fate as the early believers stolen from me by dead religion. Jude compared these ungodly men to raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Verse 13. What was he talking about? Well, 
a wave rises out of the ocean and for a moment puts on a display of foaming glory. But just as quickly as it appears, it disappears back into the sea. Jude also compared these men to wandering stars. You and I know these phenomena in the heavens as shooting stars. All of a sudden, a shooting star will flash in the night sky in a spectacular blaze of glory and then quickly disappear back into the darkness from which it came. Similarly, these wandering stars, after appearing as bright lights of truth for a short season, would slink back into the blackness of darkness that was reserved for them forever. These men are so also called clouds without water, verse 12. Throughout the Bible, water is used as a type of the Holy Ghost. For instance, we saw earlier that Jesus likened the Holy Spirit to rivers of living waters flowing from our inner, innermost being, John 7, 38. So these clouds without water were men who stole the power of God from the early church. They crept in unawares, using doctrines of men to steal the faith of believers until there was no faith left, until the church plunged into the dark ages, having lost her faith to a large extent for hundreds of years. No wonder Jude compared these men to clouds without water. In a drought, a cloud without water may come over the horizon looking promising. It may put on a good show as it drifts overhead, but when it comes to producing needed rain, that cloud is powerless to do so because it has no water. So the first criterion to walking in the power of God is that I must be a cloud with water. In other words, I must be filled with the Holy Spirit. But evidently, just having the Holy Spirit isn't enough. I used to think that the baptism in the Holy Ghost was all I needed to automatically see God's power released in my life. Wrong. I know people who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost for 40 years. But if you measured the power of the Holy Spirit by the fruit of their lives, you would come to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit had no power at all. I finally came to the conclusion that even though I was a cloud with water, even though I had been filled with the Holy Spirit, there still must be something I had to do to walk in God's power. Just having the Holy Spirit wasn't enough. There had to be a way to release Him on the inside of me. There had to be a way to get all that Holy Ghost power out of my spirit and onto the problems that needed to be overcome. At times, as I sat in a service listening to a minister preaching the gospel, I wanted to raise my hand and say, Excuse me, Mr. Evangelist, but the Holy Spirit you're talking about, the one who moved on the face of the deep, is he the same one who now abides on the inside of me? Well, yes, son, he would say. Well, then, Mr. Preacher, could you please tell me how to get all that power out of my spirit and loosed on the problem? Because until now, the common cold has whipped me. I knew there had to be a way to release the power on the inside of me, and later I found out there is. And it is just as deliberate and as power-releasing as you want it to be in your life. Rising above a carnal, sense-ruled walk. Jude had more to say in verse 19 about those clouds without water who had crept into the church unawares. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. These ungodly men were sensual or sense-ruled. That means they were dominated more by the carnal appetites of the flesh than they were by the Word of God. It goes on to say that they had not the Spirit. These men did not have the Holy Ghost in operation in their lives. Therefore, they were separated from truth by the devil and by carnality and the lusts of the flesh. So, evidently, being filled with the Holy Spirit must have something to do with not being dominated by the flesh. It must have something to do with whether disease stops me or I stop the disease. Somehow, there must be a way to release the Holy Spirit in my life so that instead of poverty paralyzing my progress, I can turn around and stop financial lack in its tracks. I am not a cloud without water. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm a tongue-talking, devil-stomping, mountain-moving, faith-filled believer. I don't have to be like those who separated themselves. Why don't I? The next verse follows the same line of thought as verse 19, and it tells me why. But you, beloved, you who do have the Holy Ghost, Build yourselves up on the, your most holy faith. Build yourselves up above a walk that is dominated by the senses by praying in the Holy Ghost. This edification process of Jude 20 delivers us from the strife field.
carnal condition described in June, Jude 19 and enables us to live continually in Jude 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. In other words, praying in tongues is the bridge between a state of strife and sensuality and the love of God. Oh, how much we have sought God for that elusive increase of the faith God deposited on the inside of us. And here was this verse all along, giving us in black and white an ironclad guarantee that we can build ourselves up. Up where? Up above a walk where disease brings us to a standstill. Up above a walk where poverty reigns in our lives. Up above a walk where our children are lost to the world forever. Up above this sense-dominated realm where we are more moved by what we see, hear, and feel than what we are than we are the word by the word of God. We can release the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives as we build ourselves up on our most holy faith. How? By praying in the Holy Ghost. Pray until the power comes. Mark 11.23 says that I can say to a mountain in my life, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and if I don't doubt in my heart, I'll have what I say with my mouth. The condition that must be met here is that I do not doubt in my heart. Then, in verse 24, Jesus states that I shall have whatever I desire when I pray, believing that I have received my answer. So, once again, the only stipulation other than that my prayer must be according to the will of God is that I must not doubt in my heart. Well, that makes this fact very significant. I found something I can do on purpose, as much and as long as I want to, that carries God's guarantee to edify me and to build me up on my most holy faith within the part of me where he said I must not doubt. Therefore, when I speak to the mountain, the only question left between me and a walk of devil-stomping, mountain-moving power is this. Do I have the guts to pray until the power comes? Because it's not a question of whether or not the power will come. It will come. The only question is, do I have the guts to stay in there until it does? But, Brother Roberson, I'm a businessman. Then the Holy Spirit will come in power to your business. I'm a preacher. Then he will come in power to your ministry. The question is not, will the power come? When Jesus inspired these words in Jude 20, he took it out of all golden-tongued speculative theology and put it into the realm of fact. And if Jesus said it, it is so whether you believe it or not. This isn't a democracy. Jesus didn't ask you for your vote. Your job is not to change God's truth, but to find it. Jesus inspired Jude to write verses 19 and 20. So Jesus is saying there is a key that, when acted upon, will build you up above a sense-dominated walk where everything you've been delivered from defeats you. Instead, this key will cause you to walk in power on your most holy faith. What is the key? Using that supernatural language called tongues. Why are we edified? So we know from 1 Corinthians 14.4 and Jude 19 that we are edified when we pray in tongues. But my question to God is this, why are we edified? I mean, if I'm going to spend three or four hours praying in the Holy Ghost, I want to know why it edifies me. To know that you should pray in tongues isn't enough. If you really believed it edifies you and qualifies you to fulfill God's call on your life, the very thing you desire most in your heart, no one could keep you out of your prayer closet. Many Christians know what 1 Corinthians 14.4 says, but they still spend most of their time starting man-made programs and trying to figure out God's plan for their lives in their heads. So obviously they don't really believe that their answer lies in stopping long enough to edify themselves by praying in an unknown tongue. Therefore, knowing I should pray in tongues isn't enough. I want to know why I am edified. Why am I built up on my most holy faith when I speak a bunch of syllables in the air for two or three hours that I don't understand with my natural mind? I told God, maybe if you could help me understand why, I could help your people understand it too. Then they could also enter into a walk of the Spirit in power. You can imagine how I felt when one day the Lord opened up the scriptures to me and showed me the why behind the edification process of tongues. 
he took me back to 1 Corinthians 14, 2 through 4. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Notice that Paul says in verse 4 that he who prophesies edifies the church. Why? Because through the simple gift of prophecy, which is equivalent to the gift of tongues and interpretation operating together, suddenly the mind of Christ for that day and hour is made known to that particular public assembly. A person who prophesies speaks to men unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. Verse 3. But all exhortation has to be based on a scriptural foundation, or there's nothing to exhort about. For instance, I can exhort on Jesus stopping off at the moon to have breakfast on his way down to earth, because that's not in the scriptures. Therefore, sometimes the Holy Spirit will unveil a mystery through prophecy, illuminating the mind of Christ regarding a scripture that hasn't been understood. And after the Holy Ghost prophesies through someone unto edification and exhortation, a divine comfort comes to the body of believers that is different than an emotional high. They are comforted in a way that is stronger than emotions. The prophecy picks them up in the spirit and gives them a sense of everything is going to be okay that can stay with them for days. So when a person prophesies, it edifies the church collectively, and when he prays in tongues, it edifies him individually. However, the reasons why either the body of believers or the individual is edified are the same. In both cases, the mind of Christ is revealed. Prophecy causes the mind of Christ to be manifested collectively to the church. On the other hand, praying in tongues causes the mind of Christ to be manifested in you as an individual. For the Holy Spirit will begin to take the mysteries you've been praying before the throne of God and communicate them back to you by revelation. That's why you are edified through praying in tongues. Therefore, spending three hours praying in the Holy Ghost will be one of the wisest moves you've ever made. And if you do it every day, look out, devil. You're building yourself up on your most holy faith, receiving greater and greater revelation of the mind of Christ. And the devil has no idea what you're saying. He just has to watch it happen.